In fact, if you needed to go to the toilet, as it were, you had to be very careful about that. You were just going to creep behind a bush because in the jungle, if anything moved, everyone with their guns and anywhere near it would blast it. This is Cold War Conversations. Thanks to John O'Connor for providing our intro today. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Ron Knight served in the Royal Marines on HMS Belfast during the Korean War of 1950-1953. He was a gunner and describes the shore bombardments and how his gun was used in anti-aircraft defence. We also hear Ron describe life aboard HMS Belfast during this period. Ron also served with the Royal Marine Commandos during the Malayan Emergency, which was a guerrilla war fought in the Federation of Malaya between communist pro-independence fighters against the armed forces of the British Empire and the Commonwealth between 1948 and 1960. Ron shares details of the dangers of jungle warfare including from his own Air Force. Now, I'm asking listeners to support my work and enable me to continue producing the podcast. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Still not sure? Here's Andrew Hawes, one of our monthly supporters. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm very proud to support Cold War Conversations with a small donation each month, because Ian's put together such a brilliant range of interviews. If you want high power, there's the son of Nikita Khrushchev, there are cross-border romances, old-fashioned spy stories, and the bizarre world of East European football. If you do support the podcast, your wallet will be a tiny bit lighter, but your brain will be very, very thankful. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Ron Knight to our Cold War Conversation. I was born on the 25th of December, 1930, in Essex. Went to school at uh, age five, which was normal in those days, and left school at age 14. I immediately joined the Allen ER at the North Eastern Railway, first as a cleaner and then a fireman on the steam trains. As I approached age 18, national service loomed, and I didn't want to go into whatever I was put in by the, you know, the government, so I decided to myself to join the Royal Marines. I seen a very colourful poster which said, See the world, join the Royal Marines. So in September 1948, I joined the Royal Marines, starting at Deal in Kent, and I completed my training in 1950. At that stage, I then joined HMS Belfast at Chatham, and we sailed for the Far East to joined the Korean War. What was the training like for the Royal Marines in the the late 1940s? Very extensive. And uh, in those days, uh, health and safety was not invoked. And so we we actually did things which were considered uh, a little more risky to life and limb. So can you describe what some of those would be? Yes, uh, one of our tra- and one of our things we used to do was on Dartmoor, and we would do a, a, carrying a rucksack thirty miles across Dartmoor in, in in small units of three. So you had to find your own way. If anybody got injured, you, you amongst yourselves, you had to uh, sort it out yourself. Whereas now, the the, the chaps do the same distance. But they go with an instructor and they go as a unit. So if anybody gets injured and needs help, uh, it's there. There's an NCO in charge and there's a whole unit in charge. But we had to be self-sufficient in small units of three. 
And that, so that, that's an example. In our days, the three of you had to not only find your own way across the moors, but you had to look after any problems you encountered. And what about your, your preparation for being on HMS Belfast? Well, our, 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 our marine training, we started off a deal in, on the parade ground and spent 13 weeks literally square bashing. Then we went to Portsmouth and we did six weeks naval gunnery. Then after the gunnery, we went to um, Devon, to Lumpston, for 13 weeks infantry training. And then after that, we moved to a place called Bickley, just, in the, just on the edge of Dartmoor, where we did six weeks commando training. So it's a very, very training, but it, obviously it, it fitted us out from whatever our service might take it. From there, as I say, I joined HMS Belfast, so uh, the naval gunnery training, which we did, came in very handy because on the way to Korea, um, we, we, we built on that and did nothing but training on, the, on, our, on our gunnery. So that by the time we arrived at Korea, we were, we were reasonably quite proficient. And and what was your role on the guns? My, my my gunnery position, action station, was as a loader on a twin one of the twin four inch guns which the Marines manned. The, the, the Belfast had four six inch turrets, and the Marines manned one of the six inch turrets. They also manned two of the twin four inch mountains on the port side, and my mountain was P two. That's port side. Twin Mountain 2, and I was a loader. Uh, the, the guns mainly in the Korean War, when in, when in action, because uh, the incoming planes which would, would like to attack us were, were um, MiG, MiGs armed with rockets, Russian, Russian supplied MiGs, mainly ma- manned by Chinese, and uh, there, were, there was no, no opportunity to to uh, alter the, the shells with, with um, time fuses. We had VT fuses which exploded whenever the shell approached within 50 feet uh, of an object. So the important thing was to load the gun and fire these four-inch shells as quickly as possible. The gun was controlled mainly by the, the ship's radar and central firing control uh, position, and when an incoming MiG fighter was approaching over the horizon, the horizon only being about seven miles away, the the, the uh, gun was fixed and controlled by the radar, and the radar would determine when the gun would start firing. So we had to load the gun as fast as we could, and... Um, and that in itself became a, a work of art because you, you threw the, the, the shell into the breech. The breech, once once the firing position was, was put to fire, would knock your hand away as, a, as the shell went in. You ducked as the shell case went over your head, and then the next man behind you would be to throw his shell in. And again, so, it became, so the loaders, or there'd be three on each four-inch gun, would, would rotate quickly as possible, throwing the shell in, ducking, and uh, in, in, a, in a minute, we, we, we got so proficient at the end, we could get about 15 four-inch shells away a minute on each gun. Wow, that, that's, quite a, that's quite a rate of fire there, Ron. It was quite a rate of fire, but it was important because a, a, a MiG fighter would be coming in at, I don't know, anywhere around about, say, 700 knots, come over the horizon... And the gun would start firing before you ever heard the plane, because the, the, the radar determined when to start firing, and it would start firing automatically. And you'd be firing for you know a few seconds, and suddenly you hear the plane go over. Did did you uh, ever hit any MIGs? No, I'm not aware of. But then, then, then you would you I suppose you, you you wouldn't really know. But the main the main thing was was to ensure that the aeroplane didn't, didn't get a chance to uh, dwell on hitting you with, with its rocket. 
because a, a, a rocket fired from these MiGs at that stage, it was considered to have the same effect as an 8-inch armoured-piercing shell. So the thing to do was to, was to, was to ensure that the plane did get a chance to concentrate on and hitting you. And was the Belfast ever hit by any plane? Uh, not 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 by um, by air, an aircraft, but a shore battery did hit the, sh- the ship on one occasion and killed one of our crew. It happened to be a, a Chinese uh, sailor on board, but that was the one and only time we actually got uh, hit. We did a lot of naval gunnery and uh, and did a lot of bombarding the uh, the shoreline, uh, Incheon, Hung Nam, uh, a couple of ports in mine on. I got in mine. I can remember. So, our, and our job was also to fire, give supporting fire, uh, army units in land. Uh, if they needed incoming fire, we, we would provide it. At other times, we, we hit targets which we could see on the shoreline. Uh, maybe a train going a lot, you know, near the uh, near the uh, the seashore. Um, and we, we would try and hit them and the, the, the tunnels that they were about to enter. Right. Was was that with the six inch or was that with the four inch? That, uh, sometimes it's four inch, but mainly the, the heavy uh, bombardment would be with the six inch guns. The four inch mainly were used as anti aircraft, but they could also fire shells which 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 turn into a flare once they explode. So it provided. Light, as it were, flare light, if, if it, that was required. So like a star shell? Star shell, that's right, yeah. So how close were you to the shore when you were carrying out these bombardments? Uh, at times, I, I, the, the, the atmosphere there was very cold but very clear. So, you know, you, you, you saw very clear. I suppose at times, uh, maybe about five miles away. But, of course, that is... You, the, the gun would have a the four inch guns alone would, would have a about twelve mile range, and the six the six inch guns more like fourteen to sixteen miles. Wow. So we, we especially when you're firing uh, way inland, you then you'd need to get closer to the shore, of course. And what what was life like on board, Ron? Uh, my recollection in particular was how cold it was in winter off Korea. And when we were on duty on, on the upper deck man in the guns, we used, we, apart from our anti-flash gear, we used to wear, wear duffel coats, fur helmets, uh, long woolen um, long johns. It, 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 it was extremely uh, extremely cold. <laughs> that was one of my particular uh, recollections. Because a, a lot of the time, of course, at action stations, we, 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 it, it was in winter and it was very, very cold. Well, in one place, uh, I recollect seeing there was ice beginning to form on the sea, like small ice flows. So extremely cold, at least thirty below, you know, thirty degrees below freezing. And and what what was the the food like that you got? Uh, food is pretty good. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, we had a crew of eight hundred and fifty on board. And we, uh, and on the Marines themselves, on the Marine deck, there was about a uh, hundred Marines, and we, we all we each had a uh, a mess deck, uh, and a mess table on the mess deck of, of, of about ten chaps. So we, we we ate reasonably well, I thought. And and the rum ration was still in operation. The then. rum ration that itself was was wonderful. R- rum was the currency. The, the best currency at sea, because with rum, with rum you could buy almost anything. Uh, and it was always traditional that on your birthday, all your mates would give you a sip of their rum. And that ran out to a lot of sips. So, yeah, the rum was wonderful. A tradition, as is tradition on the, on the ships, on ships that had marines, it, it was a marine, the marine uh, butcher, trained to be a butcher, amongst other jobs. He, he helped, his, his job was to help distribute the rum. And marines and seamen were very cute at finding ways to uh, sneak a little extra rum. So they, when the rum was being dished out from 
from the from the uh, the barrel, uh, they would they would put their try and put their son in the in the uh, flagon that you know that held the rum. So <laughs> that way, the butcher ended up uh, with a little extra rum, which he could bring back to the mess stick. <laughs> uh, so his particular mess was always very well endured with a little. And jailed with a little extra rum, and I was lucky enough to be on the mess deck next to the butcher's <laughs> tables, so uh, we got a little sometimes. But rum, rum in itself was really, it was very good rum, and I say it, it was a currency that was to be really treasured at sea. And were were you in hammocks on Belfast as well? We stepped on board in, in, in hammocks, yeah, very close together. One of the things I felt I found when I first went on the ship, we were kept awake at night time uh, by the, the sheer noise of, of electric motors and dynamos running. But after a few weeks, I found you didn't hear it. But if for any reason the dynamo switched off, you were woken by the silence. So in the reverse, it's strange how, you, how, you, how your body reacts. So if anything went wrong and, and dyna- the dynamo stopped, the silence would wake you up. I understand that the Royal Marines also carried out raids on the shore. We've got, uh, I know in particular, uh, one raid uh, two of our Marines got involved with, a Sergeant James and a Corporal Hamill, they got involved in a small um, raid which was combined with, uh, with, uh, with troops and, and, and other departments but something happened on the raid, and it's, it's not known to this day what happened because when they were not heard of again. But they are mentioned in the memorial in the chapel on board HMS Belfast. Something happened, and uh, catastrophic, I suppose, because there was, there was no message from them, and uh, the whole thing just ended in a catastrophe of one sort or another. They, they, you know. Whether they hit a mine, uh, whether they, if they were captured, they were certainly uh, never heard of again. So um, we lost we lost those two, two gentlemen, a Sergeant James and a Corporal Hamill. Other than that, and the Chinese seaman who was killed by a shell with it, with, uh, from a bombardment which hit the ship, uh, we had no uh, no casualties. Right. Did you go on, on any of the raids? No. Um, they they probably had a, a specialist requirement, um, maybe in demolition or uh, one of those, you know, there are many extra uh, uh, qualifications we could earn and demolitions was one. So, so, so but our main job actually was, was manning the guns and, and bombarding to support uh, the servicemen and the troops abroad, you know, in shore. Sometimes British, sometimes uh, American, of course. So we fired, and we, we fired a lot of shells in, in, in support of, of our troops ashore. When I started there, I first got there as American in charge of all the, Nas- uh, the uh, United Nations, including ourselves, was General McCarthy, well known from the Second World War. But there came a, start, a time when he was, it was decided to relieve him of his of his command, and give him a, a, a higher-ranked job in America. And we got another another America general came in charge. Um, I've always felt it was feared that General McCarthy tended to be a little bit gung-ho by reputation, and it was feared that the intense attacks which were coming, not just by the North Koreans, but by the, by the Chinese, who were literally pouring into Korea, uh, he may dec- may have decided to use the atom bomb, <laughs> and that, that, that you know they weren't prepared to risk that. So he, he was given a, a, a desk job back in in, in the states, and, and we got another American general in charge. Because at that stage, uh, Russia had the at, at atomic bomb, and our fear was that if in fact they did that, they would then threaten Japan. And that they then would become dominated by you know, communism, which would then really have been serious for the, our Far East interests. 
it's, iron- it's ironic that we fought Japan, and within a few short years later, we were defending Japan to ensure, with the United Nations, to ensure that it wasn't taken over by the communist influence. So, though the Second World War, they were a bitter enemy, they were our home base during the Korean War, where we would go to re ammunition the ship and have a short time ashore. Sometimes we went to Sasebo, a Japanese naval port. Other times it was Kiri or Yokosuka. And we, we found no problems going ashore with the Japanese. <laughs> and in fact, we held no fear. It, it was just like just going to your, your home port. And it, it just seemed strange. It was only a few short years after World War Two when... You know, we, we were, they were our bitter enemies, Japan. But um, that's that's politics. That's how life in the world changes, how quickly it changes. Ron, I've seen a photo of some Chinese and North Korean prisoners of war on the Belfast. Did you did you see these prisoners? Uh, I saw uh, I saw them, but we were basically they kept, they were brought on board. Uh, the Belfast to be conveyed back to uh, Japan. So we, we, you know, we, we, we were just taking them back to Japan. It's a great photo. I think they're being guarded by the Royal Marines. Yeah, they, they, they are. Yes, that was our sergeant major and one of the uh, one of the Marines. Yeah, he definitely looks like a sergeant major. The one that I can see in the photo. <laughs> um, uh, what what was the trip like? Back to Japan. Did you hit any typhoons or anything like that? Yes. Well, one, on one occasion when we we, we, we returned to Sasebo, it was a Sunday morning. We were uh, about to have have a small church service, and the message suddenly came that Typhoon Ruth, which was coming up the South China Seas, had suddenly veered in direction and was heading straight towards Japan, where we were. And the last thing you could allow was to be in harbour if it was hit by a typhoon. So the message was immediately that all large warships had to put to sea. So we immediately uh, left, left Sasebo, headed out to sea, and then the various ships in line astern headed straight out towards the typhoon. The, the thing to do with a typhoon was to meet it head on. Not, not have it at the, at the side, you know, on beam at the side of you or behind you. So we headed out to sea, and the various warships then headed in straight line, direct towards the typhoon, and after a couple of three days, went through it and then came out the other side. We came out of it, even, even a cruiser like the Belfort, a little battered, actually. It, it did some damage to our, um, our propellers, and subsequently after that, we ended up going back to Singapore for a refit to get the, get the damage done and at the same time change the gun barrels and, and other work done. So we spent on board the ship. So we spent three months living in barracks at Singapore. And that was a direct result of the damage that was done to us by Typhoon. I remember some iron doors which protected the, tu- the torpedo tubes and they were bent. The weight of the water coming over the over the bows and, and over the ship would be several thousand tons of weight. It, it did quite horrendous these typhoons, and uh, uh, it actually buckled doors, as uh, so, uh, I say, of three inch thick steel. You, you can't you can't, Im- can't imagine it could do that, but it did. And one of the incidents also it caused the ship rolled so much. Some of the four-inch shells in the four-inch shell magazine down below, the roll caused the shells to roll out of their racks. They were held in racks upright by clips, and they started banging around the magazine. Live shells banging around the, the magazine. And in the end, the problem was only solved when it, they realised that the thing to do was to throw as many hammocks as possible. You couldn't go down there because the shell was banging from side to side would, would just break your legs. Uh, so we, hammocks were thrown down there and gradually uh, the whole lot of the shells were sort of held locked, locked together by shield numbers of hammocks. <laughs> so that, that was that was extreme, an extremely dangerous 
what, what, what were your sea legs like, Ron? I was I was not a particularly good sailor. I, I, I copied Nelson. I was I I had my share of seasickness, and real seasickness is a, a, a renders. It, in fact, in Typhoon Roof, a large part of the crew were rendered fairly uh, useless, to put it mildly, and that included me. Se- seasickness, you know, really makes you totally unable to really do anything. And um, yeah, so. Typhoon had a great effect on us. Funny, it, it subsequently changed my career because when we went down to Singapore and lived in barracks for three months while the work was done on the Belfast, I, I was in the nappy one day and some Royal Marines that were, came down there from 45 Commando who were serving in, in Malaya and they would come down there for a week's leave. And I was sitting at one of the tables with one of these Marines and he said, I was an ex-drummer. He said, I always wanted to go to sea. I'd love to have been on a ship like yours, like the Belfast. Uh, so I said, well, over our pun- would you like a change? And there and then we, we decided that we would re- request to our respective commanders to, to do a mutual swap. Me to go to 4-5 Commando and, and, uh, and take his place, and he come on board HMS Belfast. So, uh, as it happened, after our refit, and I was still on board, we, we set sail back towards Japan, and there was an incident en route which is worth mentioning. We, we were doing action stations at, at, in the dark practice. The gang rails had been lowered to enable the torpedo tubes to be trained in outboard in the correct position, and the canteen manager decided to come up on deck. So he came from a lighted area inside the ship onto a darkened deck, and he didn't see that the gang rails were down, and he was partly blind, having come from light to dark, and he fell overboard in the middle of the south side of the trees as we were heading back towards Japan. And luckily, of course, he, he was... The, the men on deck, upper deck, we saw him fall and the alarm was raised. Our captain took a very wise decision once he got the alarm. He arranged for the ship to go into a, into, into a stern. And he, he, he went astern for the, for the amount of time he judged was appropriate. And we, we then stopped and the searchlights were, were, were brought on. And they actually found this this, this county manager still floating. He hadn't been taken by sharks. He hadn't been killed by the, the ship, you know, reversing and drowning him with, with suction under the ship. And he, he was pulled out of the water and he survived. And one of the luckiest men I, I, I can imagine alive on that, on that ship. And then we con- con- continued on our way back to uh, Japan and carried on around Korea and then December, that would be, let's see, that was, I'm trying to command, in December 51, I suddenly got a message, uh, Marine Knight, get your kit quick, there's a destroyer heading down to, down to Singapore, and you're due, due to be on it, because your, your, your relief has just, on about, is about to arrive, and four or five commanders, so, we were about to be exchanged in December 51. So I took passage on a destroyer, went down to Singapore, went by train to uh, Ipoh, a large town in, uh, in, in northern um, Malaya, and, uh, and th- then joined 45 Commando. So I, became, I then became a command, commander in 45, and my, uh, my ex-drummer colleague... <laughs> Who I'd swap with, he, he, he took up my position on HMS Belfast. So I, I, I spent over a year in, in Korea, and now I started in the opposite, in the jungle, with, with uh, Belfast Commando. So uh, and then I, I, I spent a, a, a year there. Uh, different type of life, <laughs> not cold, <clears throat> very hot, very wet, and uh, we used to go out into the, the jungle on on patrols, sometimes for as long as two weeks, 
living and sleeping out there. The objective being to try and track and trace, or at least neutralise, communist, communist insurgents who were then trying to take over Malaya in the interests of the communists. We'd armed them and trained them during World War II to fight the Japanese in Malaya from within the jungle. But when said War II was over, these Chinese insurgents then decided that they wanted to take over Malaya because it was a a very mineral-rich country. And that's why we we then had to fight them. So it's ironical that... (laughs) How how things change. Anyway, eventually, uh, British forces were successful and Malaya was then handed back in due course to the local people and they renamed it Malaysia. So when I was there, it was Malaya. But And that's what my campaign medal says, Malaya, on the clasp. But it, it then became Malaysia. So... So I, I had a, a varied life there abroad in the Far East, uh, half on half on a ship in Korea and the other half in the jungle in, in Malaya. So I saw both, both both sides of the coin, as it were. Did you have any special training, like tropical training or anything like that, before you went into the jungle? No, I, from, from, yeah, me personally, from day one, uh, I... I, I I, I, you know, I, I was allocated a, a, a troop and a section within that troop, and immediately went out into the jungle. And I learnt, I learnt the jungle ways very quickly, <laughs> and one did. But um, and my particular j- job within the troop was to carry one of the one of the Bren guns. So we used to go, I used to go out in the jungle with a Bren gun slung over me, my shoulder, a pistol, and a part of ammunition. We all carried grades, you know, an, uh, an explosive grade, grenade and a phosphorus grenade. So we, we went well armed. And each section would, 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 would consist of a number of weapons. Two were brain guns. Uh, other, others were short, uh, short-barreled uh, rifles. And we would have a couple of um, the old-style rifle with a cut discharger so that we could lob grenades. And we also used to have somebody with a stand gun with a silencer on it, and uh, others others were armed with um, the carbines, American carbines. So we had a, a whole miscellaneous of, of different weapons. But my particular weapons, I say, was was carrying one of the bang guns. Ron, how how long were the patrols? The, the patrols varied, but sometimes it was uh, as long as. Uh, uh, three weeks, uh, uh, longest one I recollect. We would go out, and we would we would uh, live literally out in the jungle at nights, nice making a, a, a crude basher uh, to um, to sleep. Uh, you never moved at night, of course, because uh, that, that, that was very dangerous. Each of us, each of our uh, patrols, we used to have um, uh, a couple of E-band trackers. They were men from Borneo. And uh, they, their job was to help help us track, so that we would track. When, once we found any trace of uh, any of these insurgents, we would track them day after day after day, and they would and we'd all keep they'd keep moving around. But the main thing was, whilst we kept them on the move, they couldn't get up to any da- uh, you know ambushing and killing people in the villages or the campons as, as we called them. So that was a, that was our, our main job. I did to get them if we could, or if not. Keep them on the move so they they couldn't be dangerous and and uh, and it was a kill or be killed. You wouldn't dare be captured by uh, one of these insurgents because some horrible things were done. Sometimes people had you know penis cut off, stuck in their mouths. I, I, I remember while I was out there, there was one army patrol of nine guardsmen and a whole lot of white out in an ambush. So they were they were quite good at ambushing, but then we also, if we could, ambush them. So it was, so it was kill or be killed. It, Mainly by ambushing. Ron, did you get into any firefights or did you find any insurgents? I, I never pers- personally, at w- w- the time I was there, got into a firefight, but we've got instances where other people, other uh, troops, have been in a court, may- maybe had a casualty, 
and our job was to was to follow was to meet with follow up. So we were following uh, actual, but we never actually, whilst I was with them, actually caught up with them. But we kept them constantly on the move, so that uh, and whilst we were doing that, maybe they would move into areas which was unfamiliar to them, and they could get killed by other units. So it was it was a combined effort of a pursuit, looking and keeping them on the move. And Ron, I mean, you said you were on patrol for like up to three weeks. How were you supplied? We, we took what we could initially, but then after that, we had we had a, also I used to have a radio with us, carried by a couple of local natives, and, and the radios in those days were quite a weighty thing to carry. So they carried the radio, and um, we would we would when from time to time radio for su- supply, ammunition, and and things like that, and food. Uh, and, and changes the footwear, and it would be dropped to us on, on, by small parachutes, which would be aimed into a clearing where, we, we, where, where we'd range for the delivery. And once we'd allocated a delivery and sent the message, we used to carry uh, coloured panels, at which, we, we, which we could make letters on the ground or in the small clearing, and so that they could identify which unit we were, and then these small parachutes would come in. They'd come in very low, and they'd almost come in quite fast on these small parachutes. Uh, we used to have, a, from time to time, a little drop of rum dropped to us as well. And on one occasion, I remember, all the chutes hit the clearing except one, and it was hanging up on the tree. <laughs> and when we checked out what was arrived, the, the parachute up on the tree was carrying our rum. <laughs> that was eventually shot down. <laughs> Uh, normally in the jungle, so there was no smoking allowed. All day long, you didn't talk. You never got within a few feet of your colleagues. Uh, everything was absolutely quiet. But on this one occasion, we threw total caution to the wind, shot shot this parachute down, got possession of our rama plus the other stores, and we, we, made, we made sure we moved away from the area because we'd done a very dangerous and, in a sense, silly thing. But, uh, you know... Rum to us was was important. Did you get any um, air force support in terms of bombing? Yeah, yeah actually, uh, the, the the RAF they had some Sunderland flying boats, and from time to time uh, they would fly over the jungle and drop a stick of bombs. This apparently was to demoralise uh, again to demoralise these bandits down in the, you know. If, if any of these bombs drop near and down in the jungle. And indeed, occasionally, artillery units from the road, used to, with large artillery pieces, used to fire sh- shells with the, with the same idea into the jungle. All they could see was jungle, and they'd fire large shells. At the end of those shells and bombs, at times, could have been us. So one of the things we feared, we heard a flying bloke going over, we, we, we almost prayed they wouldn't start dropping a stick of bombs. I, I, on one occasion, subsequently in recent years, uh, a club I was in, we had a, an ex-wing commander of the, of, of the, in the area, and his story was to tell us how when he, when he, when he was serving in Malaya, they used to fly over the jungle, and would you believe it, drop bombs and demoralise communist insurgents. He gave his talk, and after the end of it, he said, are there any questions? I said, look, sir, put my hand up. I haven't got any questions, but I've got, I've got a little point, comment I'd like to make. I, I said, we fear the sound of you coming anywhere because when you were dropping those bombs, we were down there as well. You didn't know where you were dropping, where you were hitting, and uh, we were at risk as, as, as well as these, you know, these insurgents. So he, he, didn't shout, he didn't say anything about that. He, he, uh, he concluded his talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you you said you had to be quiet all the time. So did you you had some sort of sign, you know, way of signalling to each other what they what you were supposed to do? Every, every, you, you, you tried not to get near each other, but when anything was happening, uh, like stopping or something, you we, 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 you would signal. Yeah, voices, no smoking. It, it, it was extremely important, in the, you know, in the jungle and. Um, in fact, if you needed to go to the toilet, as it were, you had to be very careful about that. You wouldn't go very far, and you had to make sure everyone knew that you 
you were just going to creep behind a bush because in the jungle, if anything moved, everyone with their guns and anywhere near it would blast it. So it was ex- <laughs> extremely dangerous. You know, call to nature were, could be extremely dangerous. But yes, uh, it was all, all, all signals. How, how did you recognise friendly units? Uh, we, we, one of the things we had to ensure was that we didn't meet any friendly units. Uh, we used to wear a white cross on our hats. We were, we were given large areas of jungle, and the whole plan was that you, you never met another unit, because if you did, um, every, you know, we'd, we'd have blasted the hell out of each other, because, as I say, if anything moved, you fired at it immediately in the jungle, and you, you click it to be the enemy. So it would be a catastrophe for one unit to have met another. And, and and Ron, I mean, you know, we talked about the conditions earlier. Presumably you got really bitten by mosquitoes and all sorts. Yeah, cu- cu- covered with um, mosquito bites. But, and we also uh, we had lots of different injections. And, and, and as well, uh, for water... We, we would just use swamp water because that's you know there was no running tap. You just you just had swamp water, but we used to put a, a water pure, purifying tablet in the water, and then boil it and make it into tea. And um, you, you wouldn't dare hold this water up into the light because it'd be it'd be literally full of little crawlies. But of course, the boiling water. Uh, would certainly kill them, and and the the water if you appear and find tablet we put in also would make the water so so we we, we actually drank swamp swamp water, and uh, I'm still here to tell the tale. Right. What did the tea taste like? Good because we put plenty of sugar in it, and 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 and, and you know, all, all all tin stuff like you know. But um, yeah, it, it, it was nice. It was a luxury. But yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was your way of getting the fluid because you couldn't drink the water neat because uh, you'd, you'd be put off of what you saw. Looking at your time in Korea and your time in Malaya, what would you say was the most dangerous moment that you were in? Well, every time we went out into the jungle it was dangerous. But in another sense... When I was on Ocean Belfast and some of our shells broke loose in, in Typhoon Roof and started rattling around the magazine down below, uh, that was extremely dangerous. Actually, the shells are not are not live, uh, actually, in the sense that a shell only becomes live when it's fired out of the gun and, and the rotation it's put on it as it goes through the barrel that actually arms the shell and makes it then ready to explode. But notwithstanding that, to have live, high-explosive shells banging around a shell room in a storm uh, was also extremely dangerous. So it, that, that is the, the possibility of the biggest catastrophe I'd have been on because that would have blown the ship up completely once a magazine goes. The, the, the danger in Malaya was more discomfort and ongoing. You know, it was there constantly. Um, so, yeah, the biggest danger was probably doing typhoon roof on, on the Belfast when some of the shells broke loose. How long are you in, in Malaya until? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm in a few notes to remind myself. Um, I left I left the uh, Malaya, the P- 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 five Commando, came back to this country in December 1952. And when I got back to England... I was then assigned to HMS Victory. That's Lord Nelson's actual flagship that is in Portland Dockyard, in Dry Dock in Portland Dockyard. So I was drafted to HMS Victory. Now that's in Dry Dock, so that didn't that, that was quite steady in storms. <laughs> and that was a very interesting job. So I, I spent just over two years on there and my job actually was taking people, visitors, around the ship. We lived on board. Again, we slept in hammocks. Our food was cooked on the, nearby on the jetty in a small kitchen, and we ate on board. Again, it's, it's, it was considered to be the... Well, it is the Commander-in-Chief Portsmouth flagship, so we also got our run ration on there. So it, it, was, it was very interesting and had all the benefits 
and I spent just over two and a half years on there. That was very interesting. Um, and some of the things, some of the scenes of Bly and the Bounty were photographed uh, on, on the victory. Uh, I remember the Queen visiting, uh, visiting us when she was in harbour on, on the Royal Yacht on one occasion. Um, the BBC sometimes would come and recall. They wanted to sometimes to recall the sound of wind blowing through the rigging. So they had genuine record uh, for any of their plays. Uh, or, or the sound of a, a cannon being rolled out on the deck. So it really was a, ge- a genuine sound which they were recording. And our visitors you know, included all sorts of um, high dignitaries. And also, which I, which I enjoyed actually, every Trafalgar day, the 21st of October, about the Trafalgar being in 1805, every Trafalgar day, the Command in Chief Portsmouth would lay a wreath on the spot on the quarter deck where Nelson fell. And the two years I was on there, I had the honour of. Um, Presenting the, the wreath to the commander in chief to lay. Uh, I, I, used to, I used to think that was enjoyable. Yeah, that's a real honour. Ron, I I understand you you were on victory when Commander Buster Crab, the uh, diver, went missing. Yeah, a, a, a Rus- a, a, two, two Russian leaders came over from Russia to meet the commander in chief. Um, on board the victory, and uh, Buster, Buster Crab, as an intelligence, uh, naval intelligence man, uh, had the job of swimming under the ship to, get, to have a look at what sort of p- protection the ship had. Two Russian leaders coming to this country, it, it, it very quickly realised, would come on the most up-to-date Russian warship. So therefore, if we wanted to find out what it had by way of detection underneath the submarines and things like that, it would be on that ship, and that's why Buster Crab uh, was um, obviously given the job. Unfortunately, he was detected, and of course, it is not known to this day what happened to him. Uh, I think a body was found at sea, etc. but I always feel that he would have been taken back to Russia because he would have had a lot of knowledge um, which would have been useful. So, but what happened to him? We will we'll never know. He, he just, the day he, he swam at Port Harbour to get under the Russian warship, he he was detected and never seen again. Now that was a, was a sad occasion. What other VIPs did you show round? I think you mentioned King Hussein to me before. Yeah, uh, yeah any, any any visiting royalty. Uh, or, or, or officers and admirals, any, anything like that, who visited the commander in chief Portman would be, be entertained on board the victory because in, in Nelson's uh, cabin, uh, because um, it, it was then and still is the commander in chief Portman's flagship. So, it, it, in, that, in that sense, it is still in commission. So, so in fact, yeah, that is another interesting point actually. I had two ships, therefore, in my my service, Aitman's Belfast, Aitman's Victory. Both are still in commission. Many other chaps in the Navy, uh, sailors even, uh, they had many ships who are, not, are no longer with us. They've been broken up by the, or sunk or broken up. But I had two ships, and they're both still in commission. So I, I, I find that um, um, quite an interesting point. And actually, I am still a member. I am I'm now a, a happy member of HMS Belfast Crew Association. We've got a crew association, which apart from this COVID period, we were meeting on board um, HMS Belfast from time to time. And one of the great things we had on there, every, every year in October, they had a very nice lunch to celebrate the Wood Nelson's triumph at Trafalgar in 1805. And they actually have actors dressed as... There's Nelson sailors and everything, and the atmosphere and everything is great. And, and Ron, I mean, it must be really strange when you go on the Belfast after, you know, so so many years. Do you, do you go down to where your mess deck was to have a look round? Yes, 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 yes. 
Uh, actually, I'm, I've just I've just seen on a, on um, uh, on a website that uh, in, in July uh, visitors can again start going back on HMS Belfast, and our meetings will will, will resume. But during the, during the lockdown period, they have done one or two changes, you know, to the ship. And one of the things they've done is made some uh, displays, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, about the Korean War on one of the decks. So there's a lot of concentration on um, uh, detail about the Korean War. So I should find that interesting because that'll um, also include a lot of um, photographs and pictures. And uh, I'll, um, you know, probably look for myself in one. <laughs> There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.